we, um, we went out and searched Lenny McPherson's place and um, we, we weren't real sure what, what we expected to find. Uh, he had a huge safe in the place which he willingly opened up for us. But when we got there, he, uh, he met us at the front door. He lived out at Gladesville in Prince Edward Park Road. He had a fascinating guy. He had bulletproof glass, even on his wire screen door at the front. It was, it was wired there, but there was bulletproof glass behind it, so it really wasn't a, a fly screen as such. Um, but he, 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 we went in, and everything was fine. I, I told him why we were there. I said we were searching uh, for any documentation or whatever that uh, might be of assistance to the National Crime Authority. We had a proper warrant and everything else. He was quite cooperative. But when we met him at the door, he was actually on the telephone at the time, and he said, I'll just hang up. And he went to this call, and, and all I heard him say was, um, yep, yeah, no, I've got visitors. Yeah, right, hung up. And I thought, he's just told someone that the coppers are here. He was talking to Freeman, actually. And then Freeman's rung Chris Murphy. And while we are at the premises, Chris Murphy's arrived. And he come in like a Bondi tram, 100 mile an hour. You're not to talk to my client unless I'm present, you know. Um, don't do this, don't do that, don't touch this, don't do that. And I had a go at him. I, I, I virtually told him to fuck off and keep out of our way. And uh, as soon as I did it, I thought, oh, you silly bugger, he's obviously got a tape recorder on him, you know, and you'll probably make a complaint about the way that I've spoken to him. And I thought, I don't really need that sort of thing. But McPherson turned around to him and he said, listen, Chris, he said, go up the backyard and sit down. He said, they're not causing me any aggravation. And he said, uh, just keep your nose out of it. I'll talk to you when I'm finished. And Murphy, like a little kid, had to sort of go up and sit down and keep out of it. So that was Lenny. And, and, and he, I think he appreciated the way that we treated him and, and handled the thing on that particular night. We, we seized a lot of stuff, which they went through at the National Crime Authority. There was really nothing there that was going to tie him in with anything. But at the time, he was petrified about the fact that um, his life was under threat from was going to kill him. And he got back to me and he just said, look, I'd like to have a talk to you. So uh, the, the deal at the National Crime Authority, where everything was sort of done by the book, um, was that I had to register him as an informant. Uh, Don Stewart knew that. A lot of other people didn't. And during the time that McPherson was an informant of mine, uh, people had made allegations about an improper association I was having with Lenny McPherson. And Stewart stood by me 100%. He even spoke to politicians, because they'd fed it to the politicians. And, and Don Stewart even spoke to them and said, just keep your nose out of it. I know what Schuberg's doing every minute of the day. And he's certainly you know, not doing anything improper. But I saw McPherson fairly regularly, and he, he did give us a lot of good information. There's no doubt about that. But would never involve himself in anything. He would never go so far as to say, well, I actually did this or did that. He talked a lot about people like, uh, not so much Ray Kelly, but Fred Cray, and the fact that Cray was continually trying to blame him for every crime that was ever committed in Sydney. And, and there's no doubt that the guy had so much information um, to give, and that's what I wanted from him. I wanted to get him in a position where we could offer him something to get him to sit down and tell all, um, and unfortunately, uh, it, it just never happened. He did give us a lot. Um, he'd feed little bits and pieces to us, and I used to see him fairly regularly. If anything happened, um, I could go and talk to him, and he'd find out things for me which we could use. Uh, so he was... He, 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 was, he was quite valuable to the National Crime Authority. Like before Lenny McPherson died, he, uh, he, he confided in me that he had given Flannery three guns. Um, he didn't know what Flannery wanted the guns for, but um, after Flannery got the guns, Michael Drury was shot in the kitchen of his home over on the north side, and Flannery returned two of those guns to McPherson, and shortly after that, Flannery disappeared. And my, my take on that is that um, Flanny, like Stuart John Regan years ago, was an uncontrollable criminal and uh, th there was just a cleansing process that took place. He just disappeared off the face of the earth. His wife blamed police for involvement in it. I don't think that's true. I think uh, the people involved in organised crime in, in Sydney just saw him as a wild card and he disappeared.
we have got no idea.